which I think was absolutely amazing and powerful. And uh, we're going to give him a huge, give Brynn a, a huge round of applause. He comes up right now. Come on. Hello, hello, hello. How is everyone? Everyone's good? Yeah? Why don't you turn to the person next to you and tell them you belong here? Ooh. Everyone can uh, take their seats. You guys don't have to stand for me. It's all good. It's all good. Oi, uh, got a bit dark. So, as I um, open all this stuff up, let me just get ready for a quick second. Um, yeah, did, I want to make sure, did everybody turn to somebody and tell them, you belong here? Do it right now. I, I, right now. I'm going to wait until everyone does it. So, I, I will wait. I will, I will wait. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Let's get, let's get into this. So, Today, I'm going to talk about, you guessed it, belonging. How good, how good, yeah? So, I thought I'd uh, save everybody the trouble today of flicking back and forth between their Bible, looking for this verse, looking for that verse, and instead, everybody just open up their Bibles, whether it's on your phone or physical Bible, to Luke 15, and we're going to stay in Luke 15 for, for this little sermon. So, belonging, it's a crazy feeling. It's something that makes us do crazy things. Like the, the amount of things that you know, I know I've done to feel like I belong in a community, whether at school, you know, in my BC days, the things that I would have done to, um, you know, fit in. And it's crazy what, what that feeling can do to you. It can make you feel like it, it's everything, especially for a lot of kids. It's everything to feel like you belong. See, so we're going to start in Luke 15, and we're going to go through these three parables. We're going to go through the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. I know these are three very well-known parables, but there is so much power here. There's so much power in this whole, whole book. So, um, yeah, let's, let's, let's get right into it with the parable of the lost sheep. So we're going to start at verse 1, and to verse 7. So, then... All the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. I just want to stop here for a second. The Pharisees said this like it's a bad thing. This man receives sinners. Amen. Like we are all sinners. We, are, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Yet he receives us. I, I just thought that was... Uh, Pretty funny coming from the Pharisee's mouth as well. So as we keep reading, uh, so he spoke this parable to them saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, not if he has found it, when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Wow. Wow, how, how, how good, eh? Uh, I love it how he uses the word my sheep. My sheep, because we are his. Um, I want to ask you guys a question. Have you ever flipped your, high, your house upside down looking for something? You know, we, we lose something, we don't know where it is, whether it's, you know, phone, keys, um, a piece of clothing, whatever it is. Or somewhere, someone has put it somewhere in the house and they claim to have never touched it. <laughs> and you flip the whole house upside down. You, you flip the cushions over, you, you look underneath the bed, you look everywhere trying to find it. And, and, and you're looking everywhere. But why? Why are you looking for it? Because it belongs to you. Because it has value to you. Because it means something to you. That's why you're looking for it. That's why you're flipping everything, trying to find it. See, because you belong to God. That's why he looks for you. That's why he wants you, because you belong to him. And, and he, there's this awful, just this great amount of love that he has for you. You mean so much to him, and that's why he's looking for you. Right, we're going to get into the next parable, the parable of the lost coin. Stay with me, yeah? So, 
Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, this is a pretty short parable. It's a couple of verses. But I'm going to speak about this one quite a lot. See, I love it how, how Jesus here is speaking with parables, that things, uh, parables of things that people can be obsessed with. Things like money, things like sheep. See, at the time, at the time that this was written, agriculture was massive. Like, like that was the, the source of income. You know, if you had all these sheep, you were pretty wealthy. And Jesus uses this because it's things that people can be obsessed with to show how God is obsessed with you, to show how much he loves you. See, last week was Easter, and I bet all the kids went nuts as soon as you said, we're having the Easter egg hunt. All the kids would have got up going crazy, looking for these eggs everywhere, checking everything for these eggs, right? If I hit a chocolate egg in this room, in, in this building, I don't think many people here would try to flip everything around trying to find a chocolate egg. But say I hid one one hundred and twelfth of your yearly pay. Now, why do I use that one one hundred and twelfth? Well, see, a Roman soldier got paid one hundred and twelve silver coins a year. Now, if you earned forty thousand dollars a year, that's roughly three hundred and fifty-seven dollars. If I hid four hundred dollars somewhere in this room. I feel like most people here would try to find it, would try to search for it and keep going until they found it, right? And it's pretty cool to think that God doesn't think you're worth $400 because money's corruptible. God doesn't think, you know, you're worth something that's corruptible. He, he thinks you're worth something way more precious. And I know I promised I wasn't going to flick through the Bible, but there is one verse that I quickly wanted to share. Um, so it's uh, 1 Peter 1, verses 18 to 19. Where did my bookmark go? Oh, there it is. Okay, beautiful. I'll read it quickly. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Wow, you weren't redeemed with corruptible things, but you were redeemed with Christ's precious blood. I love the word redeemed as well. You know, when you go to bowling or something like that and you get all these tickets and you can redeem your prize and it becomes your prize. God has redeemed you. Now moving into the last parable, the parable of the lost son. All right, this is a bit of a lengthy one. I'm going to go to, from verses 11 to 24. Um, so stay with me for a quick second. All right, so, then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Sorry. But when he had spent all... There arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me one, make me one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. Are you guys ready? But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to, to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandal on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Wow, how good, how good. 
I, I, I read that so many times, and every single time I read it, I felt the power in that. I, I felt, you know, this idea of the Father running to you, not caring where you've come from, not caring what you've done. He still loves you. See, the Son made the bad decisions. The Son chose to go to take all his stuff and go live this prodigal, prodigal life. And, and, and he lost it all, and he began, you know, in, in need. But who, who made him become in need? He did. He was the one that made those choices. Yet God still loved him, and God never stopped loving him. See, at any point in this story, did the son stop being his son? No. He was always the father's son. No matter where he was, he was his. See, you were always loved. No matter where you've come from, no matter what you've done. That's the great thing about God, that we all fall short of his glory, and he knows that. But we are still his, and we still belong to him. So we don't need to go, uh, go crazy trying to do things for God, because he receives us where we're at. See, like the lost son, though, we must be willing to go back to the Father. We can't just stay where we're at. We must be willing to go back to the Father and not only just go back to Him, but stay with Him, eat with Him, trust in Him, let Him provide. We need to do that. We need to go back to Him. See, because whether you are one of the 99 sheep or you're one of the lost coins or the lost son, you belong to Him, no matter where you're at. Amen. I'm going to wrap it up there, guys. Thank you for listening to me. I hope that's right. Let's go. Come on, give him a hand. Brilliant. So, so there's $400 in the auditorium? Um, I mean, you guys can look. <laughs> Sorry, I got stuck on that. No. Hey, that was brilliant. And... Uh, yeah, I love that last point, Bryn. You've got to go back to the Father. Really, really good. Isn't our future secure? Amen. And uh, the next is a young man. We've known him for quite a while now. Uh, a huge, a beautiful guy. Got a great heart for God. Loves the Word. Loves the Spirit of God. Come on, give Josh Pollock a huge round of applause. How's church going? You good? Let me just get set up. Who believes God works in mysterious ways? See, throughout this week, I was trying to think of a topic. I was like, what should I talk about? And I went for a walk, and I was listening to some worship, and I wasn't even thinking about a topic. I was just sitting down. And all of a sudden, God just dropped something in my heart. And when he dropped it, the weight was heavy. I knew that it was something from God, and it was on the topic of God the Father. And before I start talking, Brandon and I didn't talk before we did this. <laughs> the worship team and I didn't talk before we did this. Um, so God works in mysterious ways. Amen? I'm going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. If you guys want to bow your heads and close your eyes, I'm just going to pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for every single individual here. We thank you that we can be in your presence, Lord. Lord, we pray that you open up the minds and the hearts of every single person here to receive from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be a father to you. It doesn't say I'll be a father to the world, to everyone. It says I'll be a father to you. Straight off the bat, we can see that God is a personal father. He's intimate. He cares about you individually. You read a bit further and it says, says the Lord Almighty. When I first read this, I was confused. I was like, how can we go from this loving message of father, son, daughter, and then says the Lord Almighty. But then I looked into the word. Lord Almighty is El Shaddai, a biblical term. Almighty means complete power, omnipotent, unlimited power. 
So when God says he's your father, he's not just a standard dad. He's not just the dad walking around in here. No, he is an almighty and unlimited power of a father. I don't know about you, but that gives me confidence. I know that the promises that God says to us, I can have confidence that he's going to fulfill that because he's working in unlimited power. Growing up, you would know my father, David Pollock. Um, one thing you know about my dad is he's a very extra person. It doesn't matter what the situation is. He's a very extra person in a good way, in a good way. Now, growing up, I would go to sports carnivals. I was an athletic person. And I remember my dad would turn up, but he wouldn't just turn up. He would have a hat on with his glasses. He would bring a camper chair. Not any camper chair. <laughs> this camper chair would have an esky in it. It's going to be a long day, clearly. And on top of that, he would have a stopwatch. Not on his phone. He had a proper stopwatch. He would stand there looking at me as I'm about to race, like this. And he would do this thing where he'd be like, come on. Before I'd walk out, he'd say, pray before you run. If you get tired, start praying. There was no like, you know, just stop running. It was no, just pray. Pray while you're running. So my dad was a full-on person. And I looked at my walk with God, and I noticed that when I saw God as a father, the thing that I noticed was that I had full confidence that God was going to show up. It doesn't matter where I was, doesn't matter what the situation was, whether it was good or bad, I knew in my heart that God was there. And it made me realize something else. It doesn't matter what your definition of a father is, what the dic like the dictionary says, it doesn't matter what I say, the definition of a father will be based on personal experience. You will base what a father means off what you experienced as a child. The problem with this is everyone has a different father. For some, when you say the word father, you think of the word abusive. When you say the word father, you think of abandoned and absent. Maybe your father passed away. When you think of the word father, maybe you were seeking approval. Everyone has a testimony. I noticed that the expectations I had in my faith towards God as a father was contributed by what I personally knew a father to be because it was all I knew. You compare to what you know a father to be. And it makes you ask a question. Do you limit God as a father because you're comparing him to your worldly father? To put this into context, if you had an abusive father, maybe when you think of God as a father, the first thing that comes to mind is this controlling God, this God that's, that scares you. Maybe your father was absent and the thought of God as a father is hard to connect with because you never had to connect with a father of your own. If you were seeking the approval of your father, maybe you walk into the church and feel the need to do works to win the approval of your father. But in Psalms 27 verse 10, it says, Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. The blessing about perspective is given the opportunity, we can change it. When we acknowledge the wrongs, you see, I didn't even notice in myself that I was comparing God as a father to my own father. Goods and bads. Unlike our fathers on earth, we can have full confidence in God as our father because he is all powerful. I started thinking about who God as a father was to me, and I came to four points. There's many more points, by the way. You guys could probably draw on your own, but these are what stood out to me. The first one was, God will love us unconditionally. I don't know what your father was like. Maybe he only loved you with a condition. Maybe he ever, like, never actually showed that he loved you. But you see, God loves us unconditionally. It doesn't matter your sins, your past, your mistakes. He loves you unconditionally. Whether you choose him or not, he loves you. 
In Romans chapter 8, verse 38, it says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is Jesus Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. My second point where we were created intentionally. For some of you, your father may have said, you know, you were a mistake. I didn't mean to have you. You're a burden. But you see, God, he didn't make you by mistake. He actually knitted you in the womb. He made you with an intention, and you were fearfully and wonderfully made. As it says in Psalms 139, you were created intentionally. The third point was he has a plan for you. Your father may have said to you that you're going to amount to nothing. You've got no future. But you see in Jeremiah 29, 11, as I'm sure you all know, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. He has a plan for you. The fourth point is he has time for you. He hears you. God isn't that God that's sitting on the couch and, and when you're like, God, can you, can you give me some help? He's not the God that's like, no, sorry, I'm busy. I don't have time. No, but it says in Philippians 4 verse 6, do not be anxious of anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. He wants you to present them. And through presenting them, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Jesus Christ. You go a little bit further into, into 1 Peter 5, 7. It says, cast your cares and anxieties onto the Lord. Cast them. He doesn't say put them in a queue. He doesn't say there's a, there's a lineup. He says cast them. I want to challenge you with a question, actually. If you pray with the intent of having it when you want, how you want it, are you really having faith in God? Are you really having faith in God and His timing? You see, no point in Scripture does God not fulfill a promise. God's a man of His Word. He's a man of His Word. The word Abba, does anyone know the word Abba? Some confuse it for a childlike term like dad or daddy, but it actually means one's father, like my father. So it's a personal term. You know it's only used twice, like by two people. The first one is Jesus, someone who's worthy, someone who's sinless, someone who is the son of God. So you would say that he deserves, he deserves it, right? To call God Abba, my father. The second person was a lot like us, a sinner, someone who had a rough past, made mistakes. That person was Paul. And it made me realize one thing, the relationship that Jesus and God have, that father-son relationship is accessible to us as believers. It's accessible to us, that personal relationship. For those who don't know, I work in a school. Um, I work in two schools, actually, and, and these are fairly dodgy areas. The reason I can say that is because in the last two months, there's been multiple stabbings. There's a gang called 046, and it's a rough area. So I'm in the school with the children who are also a little bit rough, <laughs> but they are also got rough families. They've got stories. They've got issues. The sad thing about all of this is it's not unusual for me to hear that a father isn't in the house. A father's in prison. It's not unusual for me to hear that I get beaten up by my father. My mom was beaten up by my father. And you know what the worst one is? It's not unusual for me to hear this. That I witnessed my dad try to kill my mom. And he's in prison now. 
I hear that quite regularly. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think it, hey? Statistics show that there's a high percentage of, of people who grow up in domestic violence and grow up in, in a bad environment that will end up becoming the abusers themselves. Not only that, but people with absent fathers will grow up and go down criminal paths. They will go down drug and alcohol abuse. They will go down not a good track solely because of their father. You know what this means? That good or bad, we pick up the traits of our father and turn them into actions. Good or bad. You would actually think that living in that situation, they would choose not to do that because they don't want to do it. But because it's all they know, it's all they know. But imagine this. Imagine if we picked up the traits of God our Father. Imagine the fruits that we would produce. Imagine the actions that we would dis display in our own lives if we picked up the traits of God our Father. It says in the Word, the spiritual fruits we produce are evidence of one's relationship with God. It's evidence. You see, I want to be real. It's one thing to believe in God. You know in the Word it says that the demons believe in God. The devil believes in God. But it's another thing to choose to be in relationship with God. To have a father-son relationship. To have a father-daughter relationship. If I could just get the band to come up. If you guys would just like to stand up. If you guys would just like to close your eyes. Because throughout the week, I was praying about this. And I knew there was a reason that it was sitting heavy on my heart. I, just, I couldn't put a finger on it. And I came to a place where I realized that the Father plays a big role in our worlds, in our hearts, in our future. And it makes you ask a few questions. The first one may be, do, do you compare God as a father to your own father? Do you limit God based on your own experience of a father? The second thought was, is there unforgiveness in your heart towards your father? Maybe you're here and you're like, you know what, Josh, I'm the person that was abused. I'm the person that felt abandoned growing up. I'm the person that was always seeking the approval of God. Maybe you're one of those people in here today. <laughs> and you have unforgiveness on your heart. It actually says that, that how can we expect God to forgive us when we can't forgive ourselves? Or maybe you're someone that believes in God. You believe that God exists, but you're not in relationship with God. That when you think of God, you don't think of Him as a father and all the promises that He makes to you. No, you think of, of just the person or, or this spiritual being that's just there. So I want to give you guys an opportunity. The first one is if you are someone that believes in God, but you feel like you're not in relationship. That if I was to ask you, what's, what is it like between you and God? If you're not someone that's like, I'm a child of God. I call God my Father. If that's you with all eyes closed, can I get you guys to just lift your hands? I truly believe that there's some people in here. There's some people in here that really feel like, you know what, I believe in God, but I, I don't think I'm in relationship with Him. I don't know if my place in heaven is secure. We don't know when our last day is. I can see those hands. You can put those hands down. The second group of people, if you feel like you're someone who has unforgiveness towards their father, you feel like you haven't fully moved on 
that there's still a place in your heart where you have hatred or you have regret or you have anger. Can I get you guys just to lift your hands? Because I believe God is going to do some healing tonight, today. He's going to do some healing in your hearts. He's going to speak into those situations and you're going to see breakthrough come out. You can put your hands down. We're just going to go through a prayer real quick. If you guys would like to repeat after me. And then we're going to go into some worship. Coincidentally, it's a good father song. Because God's a good father, right? So if you repeat after me, dear Lord, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, but if you believe and you're bold about what you believe, you're going to proclaim it. Dear Lord, I thank you that you're a good God, that you are my Father. Lord, forgive me of all my sins. Lord, accept me into your heart. And Lord, I accept you into mine. I'm sorry for everything I've done. But Lord, I make a decision to come into relationship to with you as Jesus, my Lord. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And what do the believers say? Amen. We're just going to go into some worship. And I, I genuinely believe that there's some healing that's going to happen today. So if you guys would just like to lift your hands and close your eyes. And I want you to come to a place of surrender. I want you to be raw because like I said, it says that God says to cast your cares and anxieties onto the Lord. He wants to hear your request. He's not like your earthly father. No, He cares. He genuinely wants to hear. Bring your request to God. Let them be known. And start praying. right now. Sing it out, Chuck. You are perfect in all of your ways. Yes, you are, Jesus. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You know, uh, Underline what the boys said. I had no idea what they're going to speak on. The band had no idea what they're going to speak on. They didn't have any idea what they're going to speak on each other. But God put in my heart after the worship, I had no idea. You can you can bring that all into a moment of the reality of that the Holy Spirit is speaking to people here. 
I mean, I asked these guys about four weeks, five weeks ago, I don't know, whenever it was. And I said, no, I'm not going to give you a topic. So can I just say something? And, and just off the back of what Josh said at the end, if there are issues with you and that concept of a father, it does stunt your growth in God. And because it's, it's a real, I mean, I, 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 I had a beautiful dad. He was amazing. So I am just blessed. Um, but I know there's so many people that just, just don't or didn't. And, uh, and you've got to connect with God, your Heavenly Father, to know that He was always, always in your corner. That picture of turning around, looking at your dad, am I okay? Is this all good? And he's looking back at you, just going, go for it. I love you. You don't, you can't live life without that. And that's our Heavenly Father. So, you know, we've got some moments. We've got some time, and I just really sense the Holy Spirit here. These guys, give them a hand before we go any further. Thank you. Both of them. Beautiful. But maybe there's forgiveness. Maybe there's just that revelation of a perfect father. Maybe there's a blockage there in you because you, there is stuff that's happened. So we're going to open the altar and there's going to get some people to pray. Maybe Dave, you can come and help pray and a few others. Um, you know, there's moments created like this for a reason. The Holy Spirit has set this up and set you up if you need prayer. And when you're set up, it's because He wants to do something beautiful. He wants to do something powerful and He wants to make a change in your life. And uh, let's believe for that. So if that's you, while we're just singing, good, good Father, just come down the front and we're just going to pray for you. And we'll keep going here, but the rest, if you want to go, you can go. We'll just give privacy and pray for people down here. I'll be down here. Uh, Mona will be down here. We're just going to pray into people's lives. Amen. Hi Church, thanks for joining with us to Church Online today. It was great fellowshipping with you. For all details, go to www.baycitychurch.com. We love you Church.